and then then you can then you can introduce the speaker and so on yeah right okay so it's a pleasure for me today to introduce uh, Professor Takahiro Sumi uh, from Osaka University. Um, I've known Taka, I guess, for about five years or so um, to do with the Prime um, project, which is what he's going to be talking about today. So this is a, a new uh, 1.8 meter infrared telescope. Uh, the building has been the SAO's responsibility um, to construct the building to house the telescope, which is what my involvement has been. Um, and in fact, uh, next week, we are formally um, taking ownership of the building from the contractor. Um, and then uh, the following week, um, uh, Professor Sumi and his some of his colleagues from Osaka University and the uh, telescope manufacturer, uh, Nishimura, um, about, uh, I think, five um, engineers from, from that company are all descending on Sutherland for the installation of the telescope, which has been sitting in crates there since about April this year, waiting for, uh, well, both waiting for the building completion, but also waiting for uh, a situation where it's safe for uh, people to come and, uh, and do this work, you know, with the COVID restrictions that we've had. Uh, and certainly COVID has, has had a big uh, impact on the schedule of this project, but I'm, I'm very pleased um, uh, that the building is, uh, is now virtually completed. Um, the telescope will be installed and I think it's a very exciting time ahead. And I, I think by the end of this talk, uh, you'll appreciate um, how unique uh, and how important this facility will be, uh, not just to our um, our uh, partners in Japan and the United States, but also to the South African community. Um, so Taka, I'll hand it over to you and um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, this colloquium. Uh, I'm Taka Hirosumi uh, from Osaka University. Uh, I also like to thank the SAO and especially David for hosting the, the prime telescope and uh, for the building the uh, the prime building uh, we are very uh, looking forward to do uh, new science with this new, new facilities so today uh, i'm going to talk about uh, uh, let me share the slide can you see my slide yes we can yes we can so, Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the near infrared microlensing exoplanet search by PRIME and the uh, NASA's Roman Space Telescope. <clears throat> so, uh, so far, more than 4,000 exoplanets have been found. Uh, this is a distribution of the detect detected exoplanets. Uh, the vertical axis is the planet mass, and the horizontal is the semi major axis. And, uh, the, this alphabet indicates the position of the, our solar system exoplanets, uh, Mars, Venus, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And uh, black indicate detection by the radio velocity, uh, blue transit, Xi'an, Kepler, and uh, uh, Magenta direct imaging, and red is the microlensing planet. Uh, as you can see, there's no detection uh, in the right bottom. Uh, small low mass planets uh, at the wide orbit. This is because uh, we don't have any sensitivity in our technology yet, where the, we have to explore in the future. So as you can see, the different uh, method have uh, their uh, own unique sensitivity in this parameter space. And uh, microlensing is uh, uniquely sensitive to the low mass planets at the wide orbit, so cold planets. So the, this is the, uh, the rough sensitivity of the current ground based microlensing experiment. And uh, Prime uh, tried to push down this sensitivity uh, like this. And then uh, in a uh, near future, uh, the Roman Space Telescope will uh, push down this sensitivity like a two order of magnitude like this. By this, 
uh, we can ex uh, explore the most of the uh, parameter space in this diagram. So this is the same plot, but uh, the semi-major axis is normalized by the snow line. The snow line is the, the boundary uh, of the, where the water becomes solid ice. So it depends on the brightness of the host and then also the distance from the host. So the, this horizontal axis is a kind of indicator of the temperature. So by uh, using this, uh, we can compare the different planetary system with different uh, stellar mass. So uh, as you can see the, here, uh, this is the snow line. The micro lensing is very sensitive to the uh, lower mass uh, uh, planets down uh, outside of the snow line. So the snow line is very important because uh, uh, with the solid ice, the, uh, the density of the solid material increased significantly compared to the inside of the snow line. So the activity uh, of the planetary formation is very high. So the theoretical model, the simulation uh, predicts the many, many uh, such uh, low mass planets outside of the snow line like this. So comparing this and observation, uh, we can uh, uh, test the theoretical, theoretical model of the planetary formation. So the, uh, we are going to use the uh, gravitational microlensing. So you know the gravitational lensing. Uh, this uh, is the, the typical one. Uh, if we observe distant galaxy <coughs> and there is the uh, lensing galaxy along the line of sight, we can measure, we can measure the, this kind of ring-like image called the Einstein ring or a uh, multiple image uh, like uh, uh, Einstein cross. <clears throat> However, in the case of the micro lensing, <clears throat> uh, if the lensing is the small, uh, like a star, not the galaxy, uh, if we observe the distant star and the, uh, there is the lensing star uh, along the line of sight, uh, because of the gravity of the lens, the, uh, we can see the uh, two images. However, the, if the lens object is small like a star, the elongation of these two images is only the 100 micro arc second. So we cannot resolve the image like a strong uh, lens in case. <clears throat> but uh, <coughs> we can see the, <coughs> <coughs> we can measure the magnification uh, of the source stars. So if the lens is coming closer to the uh, line of sight, the background source is magnified in time like this. This is the magnification as a function of the time. So it's called the light curves. <clears throat> then uh, it's going back to the normal brightness when it's, in, it's passing away. So uh, even we cannot resolve the images, uh, we can see that this kind of time variation of the uh, background source stars. <clears throat> so Einstein first predicted this phenomena in 1936, but uh, he concluded in his paper, it is impossible to observe because the, the event rate is once in a, a hundred, uh, once in a million of stars. However, a uh, half century later, Bodan Paczynski submitted a paper uh, and uh, then uh, uh, watch the millions of stars. It's a quite simple logic. Uh, and uh, it's very short and uh, uh, simple paper, but uh, it influenced a lot. Uh, and uh, this is very timely suggestion because of the, uh, the CCD is uh, getting popular in the astronomical community. Uh, that's make us possible to monitor the millions of stars. So this is a schematic of the, uh, how to detect a planet by micro uh, This is, as I said, the light from the source is bented like this. And, and then if the uh, planet is orbiting around the lensing star and then align to the one of the images created by the host star, then uh, the gravity of the planet's micro lensing again. So if we, uh, observe such a phenomena, uh, we can see this kind of short 
uh, magnification due to the planets on top of the larger magnification due to the host star. The time scale of the such a micro uh, the such a planetary signal is uh, the proportional to the scale root of mass of the lensing object, and it's usually about a, 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 about a few weeks to the a few months for the regular star, but uh, it's about a, a few days for the planets, or even few hours for the low mass planet. So we need a high cadence observation. Uh, to detect uh, such a signal. So currently we are conducting a uh, more project, uh, micro lensing observation in astrophysics. We are observing at the Mount John Observatory in South Island of New Zealand. The, uh, the primary of the telescope is 1.8 meter uh, with uh, 80 megapixel CCD. The point of this telescope is the very wide field of view, a 2.2 scale degree. It's about a 10 times of the full moon. So thanks to this wide field, uh, we can con conduct a very high cadence, about a 15 to 50 minutes uh, cadence observation towards the galactic bulge. This is essential for the, this kind of survey. The moa is named after the world largest bird in New Zealand. So it's quite similar with the, uh, the ostrich in South Africa, but uh, it's a huge, uh, it's a height of the three and a half meter, uh, 250 kilogram weight. Uh, they cannot fly like ostrich, but uh, unfortunately they extinct uh, 500 years ago. This uh, Maori people ate them all. So I thought uh, we, I first find this picture, I thought this is the real, picture, it looks like real, but uh, it must be uh, fake because it's, it's extinct 500 years ago. So here is our observational field, uh, galactic center and the galactic plane. Uh, we are observing slightly lower than the uh, galactic disk because of the high extinction in this area. So we are observing 20 million stars in a 50 square degree uh, field. In the field with the red circle, uh, we are observing with 15 minutes cadence. Uh, with this cadence, we are sensitive to uh, uh, about the uh, Earth's mass planet. And the blue uh, 47 minutes cadence, uh, which is the sensitive to the Neptune class. And then others are uh, 95 minutes cadence, uh, which is uh, good enough for the Jupiter mass planets. With such a survey, uh, we are detecting about uh, 600 micro lensing events uh, uh, every year and issuing the alert uh, real time uh, to uh, prompt follow up observation to the other telescope worldwide. Uh, like IRSF also are following up and the Danish uh, uh, and so on. So here is the one of the uh, exposure towards the galactic bush. It's uh, not a nice picture, uh, but uh, most of the you know, uh, pixels are filled by the stars and mostly branded. So here is the zoom up of the observed images. Uh, uh, do you know, uh, it's uh, quite difficult to find the variable stars uh, in such a stellar cloud field and also conduct very good quality photometry, uh, especially. For this, uh, we use the difference imaging analysis. Uh, we subtract uh, previously taken good scene uh, reference image from each of the observations. Then uh, after subtraction, the constant star uh, disappear and we can easily find a variable object like a, a white spot or black spot and uh, uh, we can conduct very good photometry. So here is an example, how we can detect uh, uh, planets uh, in the micro uh, This is the case of the, uh, this uh, event in uh, 2029. Uh, <clears throat> so this event uh, was first discovered by Moa somewhere uh, around here. Uh, this is a you know uh, magnification as a function of the time. The the top is the overall light curves and the bottom is the close up around the planetary signal. And uh, 
after the detection of this event, uh, we uh, keep monitoring this event uh, every day. And then uh, one day, uh, zoom up, uh, this black dot uh, observation by more during the one night. And then observer uh, noticed the deviation uh, from the expected light curves uh, uh, without the planets. Uh, this is a dashed line. So uh, there is a, they, uh, the observer noticed this might be the planet and then uh, he issued a lot to the worldwide. And then uh, we stopped the observation at the morning. Then after the uh, few hours, the, the telescope at Israel first react to the hour a lot and then start observation around here. And then uh, the telescope in uh, Sutherland start observation and then Chile and the Hawaii and the New Zealand was crowd at the next day and then uh, Australia and like this. And by uh, collaboration with uh, other telescopes worldwide like this, we can cover the most of the planetary signals uh, during one day. Uh, after the analysis, we found that this uh, deviation is due to the planet with about a super Earth mass. So here is another case of the planet. Uh, after the, the magnification due to the host, there is a short, small deviation here. Here is a zoom up. Uh, this is only the magnification during the one day. Uh, this was the 5.5 Earth mass planet, uh, which was the smallest planet at the time in 26, 2006. So here is another interesting case. Uh, this is the uh, light curves. Uh, we found 1.7 Earth mass planet in a binary system. Here is a schematic. Uh, there is a one star A and B are binary, and the planet uh, is orbiting around the star B at the orbit of one, one AU. So it's quite similar with the us. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the binary uh, uh, around the uh, star. So it's uh, not uh, similar with the Tatooine. Uh, it's a uh, home of the Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars. That was the case of the, uh, the circumbinary planet. It's uh, rotating around the binary, but in this case, it's rotating uh, around one of the binary. So in, the, in this case, uh, the, the number of the uh, sun is uh, changing in the season. Uh, if this, if the, uh, uh, the planet is uh, around the, uh, the far side, like somewhere around. Uh, we can uh, see the two sun is rising and then uh, sinking at the same time. But uh, if the planet is uh, between the two stars, uh, it, the only one planet is, uh, one, so, one sun is uh, uh, rising and then uh, another is coming uh, after that. So it's a very uh, interesting system. So here's another uh, case. Uh, here's the right curve. Uh, first, we found a small magnification like a bottom panel, like uh, uh, one day. So we thought this might be the uh, free floating uh, can uh, candidate. But uh, after 40 days, we have a longer magnification like this uh, due to the host star. Because of this long 40 days separation, this, uh, the separation between the planet and the uh, host is very wide. So after the analysis, we found that this is very close to the, uh, our Neptune in the solar system. Uh, this is the first case of the, uh, uh, detecting such a Neptune analog in the exoplanet. So after uh, detecting this about 30 uh, micro lensing exoplanets, we conducted the static scale analysis uh, to measure the mass ratio function of the planetary system. This is the <coughs> histogram of the mass ratio of the system, uh, the Jupiter and uh, uh, Neptune somewhere around. And this black 
is the uh, original observed histogram, and red is the after collecting the detection efficiency. So we found uh, this uh, mass ratio function is uh, explained by the broken power law like this. And this break is uh, around the uh, uh, sub-Neptune or super Earth uh, region. So this uh, power law is uh, quite consistent with the other observation uh, by the, uh, the radial velocity or transit in the inner uh, orbit. So if we compare this measurement to the theoretical model, it's quite challenging. Uh, red is the observed uh, uh, mass ratio function. And uh, thick blue uh, indicate the theoretical model uh, with the migration of the planets after the formation. So we apparently lacking the uh, 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 heavy planets there. So if we uh, make a his same histogram without the migration after the uh, heavy planets, uh, we have a more uh, giant planet like this, but still there is a, a large gap somewhere between here. So we need a, a significant improvement in the theoretical model. And also we would like to have a more larger statistics to confirm such a, a discrepancy. Here is a, the distribution uh, along the semi-major axis. Uh, this orange indicate uh, the coming at all uh, measurement by the radio velocity. Uh, and uh, this uh, solid line and grayscale indicate uh, uh, measurement by uh, more collaboration uh, with one sigma error bar. And uh, it seems like a continuously uh, consistent with the extension extrapolation from the coming at all. And, uh, also, the consistent with the, the, the planet is more frequent outside of the snow line compared to the inside. Then, uh, next step is we try to increase the more statistics. To, uh, then, uh, our project, uh, we started our project PRIME, the PRIME Focus Infrared Microlending Experiments. The primary is 1.8 meter, same as Moore Telescope. And the field of view is 1.45 uh, square degree. The main difference is we use the H band compared to the optical in the Moore telescope. This is the first dedicated near infrared microlending survey. And uh, this is uh, tried to support the Lohmann Space Telescope uh, conducting precast observation and also the concurrent observation with Lohmann. Uh, as you know, uh, we are building the telescope at Sutherland. <coughs> And uh, I don't have to explain this in this seminar, I think. Uh, the prime objective is uh, as, uh, like this. 50% uh, of the time will be devoted for the uh, microlensing experiment. We try to study the low mass planet outside of snow line, uh, measure the free planet frequency in the galactic center uh, compared to the uh, uh, suburb of the galactic center in the optical. The, also, the uh, optimizing the Roman microlensing survey field, and also the concurrent observation with Roman to measure the lens mass and distance. The other 50% will be used for the various science with different uh, 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 members of the prime collaboration. <clears throat> and uh, for example, the, the NASA may use the Roman calibration and also the many people are interested in the TOO observation of the transient gravitational wave, high GRB supernovae or uh, Gaia objects. And the uh, Astrobiology Center is uh, uh, going to do a near infrared radial velocity uh, observation for habitable, habitable planets around the uh, M dwarfs. And uh, also uh, we try to do the near infrared transit survey around the M dwarfs. And uh, we are very welcome to any idea from uh, yours. So here is the uh, picture of the galactic center and the optical. As you see, uh, uh, near the galactic center and the plane, uh, mostly the obscured by the dust extinction. 
Uh, but uh, in near infrared, we can uh, observe the stars uh, 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 <coughs> uh, because the low extinction in the near infrared like this. By observing the near infrared, we can observe more star and more events and more planets. Uh, and then we can measure the frequency of the uh, planets around very near the galactic center. Uh, and then uh, comparing to the other uh, previous observation by the optical around here, because the number of the stellar density is different. So the, the planet frequency may be different in the center and also this around here. So it's interesting to compare the frequency in different stellar density region. And also uh, we try to optimize the Roman field and also the simultaneous observation. And uh, also, the, we can measure the mass function of the, any object in the galactic center uh, through the planetary mass to the black hole. So here is the expected uh, observational field uh, towards the galactic center. This uh, color map is the, uh, the event rate map measured by the MOA in the optical. As you can see, the event rate is higher uh, near the galactic center as expected. And the Roman is uh, observing somewhere around. Then uh, the prime will observe the very center of the galaxy, including the Roman field. So such a uh, measurement uh, can be used to uh, uh, study the galactic structure, especially the near the, uh, the structure of the Bausch. <coughs> and also uh, this, uh, you know, uh, event rate map can be used to optimize the uh, Roman to uh, Roman observation. So uh, after the launching the uh, Roman Space Telescope, we tried to measure the uh, planets. Uh, <clears throat> we tried to measure the planets uh, uh, from the ground and the Roma at the same time. So the one big weakness of the micro lensing is that we cannot measure the absolute mass of the lens object and also the distance from us. Uh, so uh, if we can measure the, uh, if we measure from the space and the ground at the same time, uh, we uh, observe the different light curves due to the difference of the line of sight. So by measuring this dif difference, uh, we can, uh, measure the distance to the lensing object. This is the so-called space microlensing parallax. This can be uh, demonstrated by the combination of the ground base and the spitzer. And uh, in infrared, we can uh, do the same with the uh, Lohmann and the prime. So here is the, the light curves uh, of the, the black is the light curve from the ground and the red is from the spitzer. So in that case, there was a, uh, time difference about uh, 20 days. So this is the same structure due to the caustic crossing. Uh, there was a time difference about 20 days. Uh, this is uh, based on the, the separation of the speech and the earth is the 1.2 AU. On the other hand, uh, the Roman uh, is L, uh, orbiting at L2. So the difference uh, separation is only the 1% of AU. So the signal is smaller. So in that case, we expect only the four hours difference. Uh, however, uh, the, the light curve feature on the planetary signal is like a, this very steep. So it is still doable to measure the, such a four hour difference. And also uh, uh, it is best separation to measure the, uh, such a parallax for the free floating planets like this, uh, because the speed uh, uh, separation is too wide for the such a uh, free floating planets. So one, if, if uh, one observe the signal, the other cannot observe the event at all. So this is the one of the major uh, aim for the concurrent observation. So if we can measure the distance to the exoplanets, we can measure the galactic distribution of the exoplanets. Uh, here is the distribution of the uh, uh, exoplanets found by the micro lens in, in red and uh, radial velocity in green and the transit in orange. 
So micro lensing is uh, sensitive to the planets uh, very far until the galactic center. So if we can uh, precisely measure the distance to the each of the events, we can uh, measure the galactic distribution of the exoplanets. Uh, whether uh, there is a good place to boss the planets in the galaxy or not. <clears throat> so here is the hardware contribution to the prime. The Osaka University and the Astrobiology Center in Japan uh, is providing the 1.8 meter telescope. The Osaka uh, is uh, funding to the near infrared wide field camera. And uh, Roman is providing the four H4RG10 infrared detectors. And the University of Maryland is manufacturing the camera at the Goddard Space Flight Center. The Astrobiology Center is providing the uh, near infrared spectrograph. And uh, Osaka are uh, providing the dome and uh, SAO is providing the building. So the key of the project is the wide field near infrared telescope uh, uh, camera. Uh, and this has been difficult because the, uh, the large format near infrared detector is too expensive. So this time uh, by learning uh, the detectors from Roman's uh, team, uh, we can uh, manufacture such a large format uh, wide field camera. The University of Maryland is uh, manufacturing at the Goddard. Uh, the field of view is gonna be the 1.45 square degree. The operational temperature is 80K. And uh, we will have uh, two filter wheels and uh, we use the Acadia electronics, which is the same electronics to be used uh, in the NASA's Roman Space Telescope. So here is the drawing of the camera uh, from outside view. Uh, inside the door, there is a cold box to reduce the radiation, thermal radiation. And then uh, we have a two filter wheel like this. And then we have a detectors, uh, four detectors here. <clears throat> so this is the picture of the engineering model uh, completed uh, last year. And the uh, flight model is currently being developed and uh, we expect to be completed in the next February and will be installed in the end of February or uh, during the March. <clears throat> so uh, in the two filter wheels, uh, we have uh, in filter one, uh, we have a brown YJH and the filter two brown, dark, Z, uh, narrow bands. Uh, by uh, combining this brown uh, and the other field, we can choose uh, one of each filters. And uh, in the narrow band, we have uh, three narrow bands in Y, J, H uh, in one filter. It is quite unique. And uh, by uh, selecting narrow band and also the uh, one of YJH in filter one, uh, we can choose uh, which narrow band to use in actually like this. The people in the, uh, the galaxy uh, are interested in to using this kind of narrow band filters. So here is the optical design of the telescope. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, F is 2.29. Uh, four collector lenses. Uh, the maximum size is uh, is uh, 45 centimeter. It's quite large uh, lens uh, with the fused silica. And the high transparency in the uh, infrared and easy to manufacture. And uh, all spherical lenses, uh, which uh, can be cheap. And 80% uh, uh, encircled energy diameter is about uh, 14 micron. Uh, which corresponds about a uh, uh, 0.7 arc second uh, in all field of view. Uh, so it's uh, enough for the uh, typical scene in the southern. <clears throat> so here is the drawing of the entire prime focus unit. Uh, here is the four lenses, and uh, one of the lens, uh, lens two is adjustable uh, for fine tuning by the actuator. And uh, here is the camera, and this is the spider. So this is the 
uh, cross section of the prime focus unit, uh, lenses, and the camera is on top. And then uh, we will use the pick off movable pick off mirror uh, to feed the light to the uh, fiber to the spectrograph like this. <clears throat> so the SL, uh, ABC Astrobiology Center is uh, currently con uh, constructing the spectrograph called the SAND. Uh, their science goal is searching for the giant planets around the young stars and uh, searching for habitable, habitable planets around the nearby m -dwells. The specification uh, is uh, y, uh, Z and Y band. R is uh, 45,000, 10% uh, efficiency. So uh, if we have a good enough uh, statistics, photon statistics uh, the nearby m dwarf at uh, 10 parsec, uh, they uh, try to measure the radial velocity in, uh, in the two meter per second accuracy. <clears throat> so last year we uh, constructed a telescope at the Nishimura factory. And uh, here is the picture of the first right. And uh, this is the first right. Uh, I think it was a Venebu. Uh, and this is the, the moon surface. And uh, we could uh, adjust the optical uh, system, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, good enough for the, the seeing of two axicons in Japan. So further than that, uh, we have to do the further alignment at the SAO uh, to with the better thing. <coughs> so the telescope, after that, telescope was disassembled and then shipped to the uh, uh, shipped from Nishimura factory uh, the December of last year, but uh, it was kept uh, for the one and a half months uh, in the port uh, because of the uh, sea transportation confusion due to the COVID-19. We couldn't find uh, the, any ship to uh, because of the uh, shortage of this kind of uh, uh, containers. Uh, you may heard of such a confusion uh, in the news. <laughs> and then it was shipped in February from Kobe port. Uh, and then uh, with further delay, uh, it's arrived to the Sutherland in the last April. And uh, because of the COVID, we can't uh, start installation yet. And uh, so the telescope has been left outside uh, and some of them are in the salt uh, storage uh, for uh, more than half years. So the last beginning of the last year, the, the construction started, uh, construction of the building started. So we are expected to be completed in the last April, but uh, it delayed significantly uh, due to the various reasons. Uh, at the beginning, uh, after the uh, uh, construction of the basement, uh, we the, it was stopped due to the shortage of steam frame, steel frame, uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, after that uh, uh, we could start uh, the construction again uh, like this. So here is the around the uh, main building, and uh, this is the room for the instrument. Uh, we have a stage for the prime focus to maintain the camera at the prime focus. <coughs> so this is the position of the prime building. Uh, and here is the salt and the KMT. Uh, so uh, you know where it is. So the dome was separately uh, built in USA by the ash dome and then shipped to the Sutherland uh, um, the, the, it was in nine, two, 2019, it's a long time ago already. So uh, here is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, construction uh, of the, uh, the dome into the building. So the uh, here is the current uh, view of the uh, building. So it's uh, almost done. Uh, currently, we are doing the 
uh, detail inside. And then it will be completed uh, by the end of this month and uh, handed over uh, very soon. Uh, this is a rough schedule and uh, it sh we should uh, update uh, a little bit, but uh, uh, we will install the telescope in this December and then uh, hopefully uh, the installing the camera in next uh, March. Uh, <coughs> and then start observation in April. And then we will create uh, the event rate map in the large in 2024. And then uh, Roman will be launched in two, 2026. Uh, it's uh, delayed a little bit. So uh, next, uh, I'll uh, tell you about the Roman. Uh, so the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is the NASA's next flagship mission after the JWST. It was recommended by the Decadal Survey Astro 2010, the previous Decadal Survey, and uh, expected to launch now in 2026. Uh, 20, 20, the main science is dark energy, uh, exoplanet microlensing, uh, exoplanet chronograph, and uh, guest observing program. So diameter of the telescope is 2.4 uh, meter, which is same as the Hubble. Uh, this telescope is given by the US uh, National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, spy satellite. Uh, they uh, uh, canceled the uh, launch in this satellite. Uh, so they, uh, they have uh, about a 10 of such a spy satellite in the sky. Uh, but uh, this time uh, we tried uh, NASA tried to use this telescope uh, looking up looking up uh, instead of down. So the wavelength is uh, about uh, 0 0.6 to 2 micron. Uh, the instrument is the wide field images. Uh, to, it's about a 0.28 scale degree and the coronagraph instrument. Orbit is L2. The mission lifetime is uh, five, five, five years, but uh, it's uh, serviceable by the robotic service mission. So this is the picture of the uh, image. Uh, it's uh, difficult to get the image at the beginning because of the, uh, you know, the security reason. So here is uh, uh, the field of view of the Roman, uh, they used the 18 h 4 detectors. Uh, this white uh, square indicates one field of view. So it's almost same as the moon. It's uh, uh, 80 times bigger than HST ACS and uh, 200 bigger than IR channel of the WFC3. So uh, the four, uh, the, their key observation, uh, they spend uh, two and a half years for the dark energy and the modified gravity uh, study. The, they conduct a high latitude survey, galaxy, uh, measure the galaxy distribution. And they observe 2000 scale degree imaging is YJH uh, and also the spectra. Uh, they will use the weak lensing, redshift space distortion and baryon acoustic oscillation and also the supernovae survey. And then they try to measure the dark matter structure growth and the cosmic acceleration history. Then uh, study the, uh, whether the expansion history is uh, that due to the dark energy or uh, due to the modified gravity. Uh, for the microlensing, uh, they will spend uh, 1.2 year for the microlensing. And uh, also they will spend uh, 0.3 year for the chronograph. And the 25% of the time will be uh, used for the general observation. Uh, with Roman, uh, here is the simulation uh, of the Roman observation. Uh, they can measure the uh, a very short uh, observation like this. They will observe uh, 300 million stars in two scale degree in the galactic bulge. 15 minutes cadence in 24 hours, 70 do, seven, 72 days. And uh, they will do the sixth season of such an observation. And uh, we expect about uh, 1,400 exoplanets and uh, 200 less than the three, uh, three Asmas. 
and you also uh, expect a, a few hundreds of free floating planets. So here is the sensitivity of the Roman, uh, the planetary mass, and the semi-major axis. The illustration indicates the position of the solar system exoplanets. The Roman can detect almost all uh, solar system planet analog except Mercury. So the Kepler uh, measure the mass uh, planetary distribution uh, inside of the Earth's orbit. Combining Kepler, the Roman can measure the almost uh, all of the parameter space. Then we can complete the statistical census of the planetary system. And then we can compare the measure uh, compared to the uh, theoretical model and to study the uh, exoplanet formation. So uh, we are uh, uh, joining to the Roman project uh, by using the, this kind of contribution from Japan. Uh, we are using the 100 nights of Subaru time for uh, supporting the Subaru and also the uh, contribution to the coronagraph instrument. And also uh, we are doing the KA band uh, data downlink station in Japan. And the fourth is the ground based microlensing uh, data uh, sharing from the more collaboration and also the uh, precursor concurrent ground observation by the prime telescope. Okay. So uh, we are also uh, conducting the, the concurrent observation uh, from the Subaru. The Subaru uh, hyper supreme cam is a uh, a uh, very wide field, 1.5 degree diameter uh, images, so which is very uh, synergy with uh, wide field imaging. So as I say, as a prime, uh, the Subaru is also the good telescope to conduct the concurrent observation like this. So uh, here's a summary. The prime is the first dedicated near infrared microlensing exoplanet survey. So we try to measure the planet frequency at the galactic center compared to the, uh, the optical observation. And uh, try to measure the galactic distribution of the exoplanets and uh, optimizing the Roman field and uh, simultaneous observation with Roman to measure the lens mass and distance. And uh, follow up the transient gravitational wave, GVRB, supernovae value, etc. And the Roman will complete the statistical census of the exoplanets. And uh, uh, the synergy observation with the Subaru enhanced the, uh, the yield of the, the Roman as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks uh, very much, Taku. Taka. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so we have some questions um, for you. Uh, first one from Nick Erasmus. Do you know yet what the exposure time, cadence, and filter sequence will be for prime survey modes? Okay, so uh, one exposure uh, will be the 10 second uh, because the background, sky background is high. So we need to uh, have a very short exposure, but uh, at the same places we accumulate until the about uh, two minutes, uh, then stack each other for one field. So the cadence, uh, uh, then we will uh, move to the other field and then uh, we are expecting the uh, cadence of about uh, uh, 16 minutes uh, to coming back to the same field again for the survey of the Galactic Bosch. And what about the filter um, sequences? Do you just so the, the main filter is H-band. Uh, and then uh, we observe in the, uh, different band to measure the color of the source, uh, uh, probably the ones uh, in a night. Right. I had a question about the uh, footprint of the prime survey field and what determined that. Um, you know, it looks like it was from, um, well, yeah, there was a, a plot that you had of the survey footprint and I'd just wondered what informed the decision to go with that field. Yeah, uh, I don't have a figure uh, now, but uh, we are doing the simulation. Uh, yeah, that one there, yes. Yeah. Uh, we are conducting the simulation uh, to trade the survey field and the cadence. 
Uh, so probably uh, uh, we are checking the six field in the very center or uh, nine field and the 12 field like this, and then comparing the planet yield and uh, also the uh, uh, to maximize the planet leap yield. So probably uh, we do a uh, high cadence in the very center and the slightly lower cadence on the outer field. And uh, we are, so in the simulation, we are expecting uh, the planets uh, about uh, between 10 to 15 every year. Right. Uh, another question from Nick was, uh, what is the SAO South Africa Communities Data Access Agreement for Prime? So the, for the bulge data, uh, you are free to access. Uh, whoever who want, uh, you can access and then uh, collaborate with us. And uh, for the uh, sharing, 15% uh, uh, so sorry, 14% of the time uh, can be used by the uh, SAO uh, community. So uh, uh, it's up to the SAO to how to select a proposal. Uh, but uh, you can apply for that. Yeah, and I might add also that uh, for transient follow-up as well, there will be access to the whole the whole collaboration uh, involved in the in the transients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there any other question? I mean, I see some other questions. Another one from Nick, but I'll, I want to ask if there's uh, other people who. Uh, we'd just like to ask a, uh, a verbal question if you turn your camera on. Um, are there any any questions that some someone would like to ask before I ask Nick's second uh, third question? Or comments from anyone? Okay, Nick, um, your third question was, um, will that be raw image data or reduced photometry tables? I guess you mean the uh, sharing of the data. Oh, sorry, say it again. Uh, he was asking, and I think it's a follow up to his question about the access and your answer uh, of the access to the um, the bulge data. Uh, will that be raw image data that is accessible or reduced photometry tables? Well, uh, it's uh, depend on our in, in infrastructure on a, uh, the you know the, the data servers. Uh, as a, in principle, you can access any level of the data, uh, but, but uh, it's uh, low data is huge. Uh, so uh, we try to uh, store uh, in the Osaka and also the in NASA. Uh, but uh, uh, probably the easiest is the, uh, you know, some uh, stack images, science images uh, for the users. Is anyone working on the pipeline for reducing the um, Hawaii 4RG data? Yes, uh, for the low level, our grad students, Yona, uh, uh, is uh, working on the uh, uh, the you know the first step for the infrared detectors and uh, co in collaboration with the guy in NASA and uh, uh, then uh, after that uh, like a difference imaging analysis the Ian Bond uh, and the uh, NASA University of New Zealand uh, who build the pipeline for the more uh, they will uh, make a, a new pipeline for the prime as well. Right. Okay. Any other questions from our audience? Just while we wait, just to see if there are any. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I think um, seeing how we've progressed over the last year, despite the hiccups, um, I think um, it's a very exciting time. I know that um, you're going to be spending some time in Sutherland together with your colleagues for, uh, for a long time. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I guess you, you mentioned the fact that the, the camera is likely to come out in March um, from the US. Uh, I guess there'll be another team of people um, potentially from 
University of Maryland or, or, or Goddard Space Flight Center who will be coming out with the uh, installation of the camera. Yeah, Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. So and then the, what's, mm, sorry, yeah. So we had a many impact due to the COVID-19, everything delayed. And uh, because everything delayed, it's uh, uh, happening uh, almost same time. So that's uh, good, uh, <laughs> good for us. Yes, yeah. Well, as you'll discover when when you arrive at Sutherland, there are three other two other teams also going to be there for the installation of of Atlas and also a spectrograph from the SAA. So it's just like a uh, a confluence of of um three different projects where <laughs> the hostel will have its largest occupancy it's seen uh, pre COVID for a long time. I think. <laughs> Um, can you tell me what the time scale is for the delivery of the spectrograph? And uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I heard uh, at the uh, end of next physical year or beginning of the next next physical year. So it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, March to 2022. 20, uh, so it's about a, a year and a, a little bit more. So you mean the end of 2022, December 2022? Uh, it's a March 2020, uh, sorry, sorry, March 2023. March 2023, okay. One year and a few months. One year and a few months, right. Yeah. Okay, um, any other, uh, oh, well, here's a, a question okay. from uh, Simon. Um, who is constructing and leading the sand spectrograph? That, that's the Astrobiology Center, right? Yeah, Dr. Kotani uh, is leading uh, the spectrograph. He built uh, IRD, uh, infrared, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, IRD instrument and the Subaru telescope. It's a uh, almost same uh, instrument. Uh, they are achieving a two meter per second radial velocity measurement for the uh, detecting the exoplanets. Right. Okay, um, then this is the last chance for anyone to ask questions. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, I think uh, there's none here, um, unless I see any hands raised. Uh, I see Petri, you've turned the camera on. Do you want to say some closing remarks? Yeah, no, no more questions, but just just uh, thanks very much for the talk. And yeah, from my part, very excited to get the telescope running on the on the site. It's it's really cool stuff. I'll actually go in a few days to with David to see the uh, latest. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to get the telescope in there and, and then the instruments, because it's really, really nice. Yeah. Thanks very much. And thanks, David, also for coordinating it. Thanks. I hope to uh, visit to the S SAO as well. And get yeah. On. yeah, looking forward to seeing you soon. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then. Um, I think uh, we can call this a meeting to an end. And thanks uh, very much, uh, Taka, for the very nice presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. And I think uh, a lot of people will start having some thoughts about how they might utilize um, Prime um, once uh, the science operations begin, which is uh, not, not too far away now. So thanks very much. And uh, therefore, I think, uh, um, yeah, Sunil, you can, um, you can close the meeting.